Welcome to Sleepy Eyes. I am your host, Varga. I take you on a journey in the dark of the night with warm tales. Take a moment to relax your body and mind with the current calmness. Breathe deeply, feel the energy inside, and let go of any tiredness. Put aside the past and focus on the peacefulness of the present moment. Recognize any tension in your body. Allow it to fade away and unwind. Discover your inner peace and simply unwind in the tranquility of now. Before going to sleep, prepare to read a story comfortably in this peaceful setting. Let the magic of words captivate you as you get lost in a tale or story. With the warmth from this peace and relaxation, your sleep will become even more serene. Close your eyes, embark on a journey with a touch of words. Let each word guide you a bit deeper toward the essence of your inner peace. Now, relax and enjoy the pleasure of getting lost in the enchanting world of the story before drifting into sleep. Sherlock Holmes Short Stories Writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle The Engineer's Thumb the exciting affair of Mr. Hatherley's thumb happened in the summer of 1889, not long after my marriage. I was in practice as a doctor, but I often visited my friend Sherlock Holmes at his Baker Street rooms, and I sometimes even managed to persuade him to come and visit my wife and me. My practice had steadily become more successful, and as I happened to live near Paddington Station, I got a few patients from among the railway workers there. One of these, a guard whom I had cured of a painful disease, was always praising my skill and trying to persuade new patients to come to me. One morning, a little before seven o'clock, I was woken by our servant knocking at the bedroom door. She said the two men had come from Paddington Station and were waiting in my office. I proceed quickly and hurried downstairs. I knew from experience that railway cases were usually serious. Before I had reached the office, my old friend, the guard, came out and closed the door tightly behind him. I've got him here, he whispered, pointing over his shoulder with his thumb, as if he had caught some strange wild animal for me. It's a new patient. I thought I'd bring him here myself so that he couldn't run away. I must go now, doctor. I have my duties, just as you have, and he was out of the house before I could thank him. I entered my office and found a gentleman seated by the table. He was dressed in a country suit with a soft cloth cap, which he had put down on top of my books. There was a bloody cloth wrapped round one of his hands. He was young, not more than twenty-five, I thought. He had a strong face, but he was extremely pale and seemed to be in a state of almost uncontrollable anxiety. I'm sorry to get you out of bed so early, doctor, he began, but I had a very serious accident during the night. I came back to London by train this morning, and at Paddington I asked the railway people where I could find a doctor. One good man very kindly brought me here. I gave your servant a card, but I see that she has left it over there on the side table. I picked it up and looked at it. Mr. Victor Hatherley, I read. Engineer, third floor, 16A Victoria Street. I am sorry you have had to wait so long, I said, sitting down. Your night journey must have been dull, too. Oh, my experiences during the night could not be called dull, he said and laughed. In fact, he shook with such unnatural laughter that he sounded a little crazy. Stop it. I cried. Control yourself. I poured out a glass of water for him, but it was useless. He went on laughing for some time. When at last he stopped, he was very tired and ashamed of himself. It was stupid of me to laugh like that, he said in a weak voice. Not at all. I poured some brandy into the water. Drink this. Soon the color began to return to his pale face. That's better, he said. And now, doctor, would you mind looking at my thumb, or rather at the place where my thumb used to be? He took off the cloth 
and held out his hand. It was a terrible sight, and although I had been an army doctor, I could hardly bear to look at it. Instead of a thumb, there was only an uneven, swollen, red surface. The thumb had been completely cut, or torn, off. Good heavens, I cried, this is a terrible wound. It must have bled a great deal. Yes, it did. I fainted when it happened, and I think I must have been unconscious for a long time. W and I returned to consciousness. I found that it was still bleeding, so I tied one end of this cloth very tightly round my wrist and used a small piece of wood to make it even tighter. Excellent. You should have been a doctor. I'm an engineer, you see. The force of liquids is my subject. This has been done, I said, examining the wound, by a very sharp, heavy instrument. An axa, he said. It was an accident, I suppose. No. Was somebody trying to murder you, then? Yes. How terrible. I cleaned the wound and bandaged it. He did not cry out as I worked on his hand, though he bit his lip from time to time. How are you feeling now? I asked when I had finished. I feel fine. Your brandy and your bandage have made me feel like a new man. I was very weak, but I have had some terrible experiences. Perhaps you had better not speak of the matter. It upsets you too much. Oh no, not now. I shall have to tell everything to the police. But really, if I did not have this wound, the police might not believe my statement. It is a very strange story and I have not much proof of it. And I doubt whether justice will ever be done because I can give the detective so few clues. In that case, I said, I strongly advise you to see my friend Sherlock Holmes before you go to the police. Oh, I have heard of Mr. Holmes, said my visitor, and I should be very glad if he would look into the matter, though of course I must inform the police as well. Would you write me a letter of introduction to him? I'll do better than that. I'll take you round to him myself. You're very kind. We'll call a carriage and go together. We shall arrive just in time to have breakfast with him. Do you feel strong enough to go out? Oh yes, I shall not feel comfortable in my mind until I have told my story. Then my servant will call a carriage, and I shall be with you in a moment. I rushed upstairs and quickly explained everything to my wife. Five minutes later, Mr. Hatherley and I were in a carriage on our way to Baker Street. As I had expected, Sherlock Holmes was in his sitting room, reading the small personal advertisements in the Times and smoking his pipe. For this early morning smoke, he used all the half-smoked lumps of tobacco from the day before, all carefully dried and collected together. He welcomed us in his usual quiet, pleasant way and ordered more food for us. Then we all sat round the table and had a good breakfast. When we had finished, Holmes made Mr. Hatherley lie down with a glass of brandy and water within reach. It is easy to see that your experience has been a strange and terrible one, Mr. Hatherley, he said. Please, he down there and make yourself completely at home. Tell us what you can, but stop and have a drink when you are tired. Thank you, said my patient, but I have been feeling quite fresh since the doctor bandaged me, and I think that your excellent breakfast has completed the cure, so I will begin the story of my strange experiences immediately. Holmes sat down in his big armchair. As usual, the sleepy expression on his face and his half-closed eyes hid his eagerness. I sat opposite him and we listened in silence to the strange story our visitor told. My parents are dead, he said, and I am unmarried. I five alone in rooms in London. By profession I am an engineer, and I have had seven years of training with Venner and Matheson of Greenwich, the well-known engineers. I completed my training two years ago, N.O.T. long before that. My father had died, and I received some of his money. So I decided to go into business on my own, and took an office in Victoria Street. The first few years of independent practice are often disappointing, 
I myself have had an extremely disappointing start. In two years, I have had only three or four jobs and have earned only 27 pounds. Every day, from nine o'clock in the morning until four in the afternoon, I waited in my little office until at last I began to lose heart. I thought that I would never get any work, but yesterday my clerk came in to say that a gentleman was waiting to see me on business. He brought in a card, too, with the name Captain Lysander Stark printed on it. The captain followed him into the room almost immediately. He was a tall, thin man. I do not think I have ever seen a thinner man than Captain Stark. He had a sharp nose and the skin of his face was pulled very tightly over the bones, but his thinness did not seem to be the result of any disease. His back was straight and his eyes were bright. He was plainly but neatly dressed and seemed to be about thirty-five or forty years old. Mr. Hatherley, he said, and I thought he sounded like a German. You have been recommended to me, Mr. Hatherley, not only as an excellent engineer, but also as a man who can keep a secret. This polite remark pleased me. May I ask who it was who spoke so well of me? I said. Well, perhaps I had better not tell you that just now. I have also heard that your parents are dead, and that you are unmarried, and five alone in London. That is quite correct, I answered. But I do not see what connection these things have with my professional ability. My clerk told me that you wished to speak to me about a professional matter. Yes, certainly, but everything I have said is important. I have work for you, but secrecy is necessary, complete secrecy. And of course, we can expect greater secrecy from a man who is alone in the world than from one who lives with his family. 4. If I promise to keep a secret, I said, you can trust me to do so. He looked at me carefully as I spoke. You do promise then, he said at last. Yes, I promise. You promise complete silence, both before and after doing the work. You promise not to mention the matter at all, either in speech or in writing. I have already given you my word. Very good. He suddenly jumped up, rushed across the room and threw open the door. The passage outside was empty. That's all right, he said, coming back. I know that clerks are sometimes eager to know about their master's affairs. Now it is safe to talk. He pulled his chair up very close to mine and once again began looking thoughtfully at me. I did not like this. I was beginning to feel impatient with this strange man. Please tell me why you have come to see me, sir, I said. My time is valuable. Of course, this was not really true. Would fifty pounds for a night's work suit you? He asked. Yes, very well. I said a night's work, but in fact the work would hardly take an hour. I only want your opinion about a machine which is not working properly. If you show us what is wrong, we shall soon be able to put it right ourselves. Will you do it? Yes, I will, I said. The work appears to be easy, and the pay extremely generous. Yes. We want you to come tonight, by the last train. Where to? I asked. To Eiford, in Berkshire. It is a little village about seven miles from Reading. There is a train from Paddington which will get you there at about a quarter past eleven. Very good. I will come to Eiford station in a carriage to meet you. Do you live far from the station then? I asked. Yes. Our house is right out in the country, more than seven miles away. Then we shall not reach your house before midnight. I suppose there are no trains back from Aford to London in the middle of the night. I should have to sleep at your house. Oh yes, we can easily give you a bed. That is not very convenient. Couldn't I come at some other time? We have decided that the night is the best time. The unusually high pay will be your reward for the trouble, but of course, you are perfectly free to refuse the work if you wish. I thought of the fifty pounds. I thought how very useful the money would be to me. I do not want to refuse, I said. I will do whatever you want, 
but I should like to understand a little more clearly what it is you wish me to do. Of course, I will explain everything to you, but it is very secret. Are you quite sure that nobody can hear what we are saying? Quite sure, I replied. Then I will explain. A few years ago, I bought a house in a small piece of land, about ten miles from Reading. I discovered that the soil in one of my fields contained Fuller's Earth. Fuller's Earth, as you probably know, is a valuable substance, and is only found in one or two places in England. Unfortunately, the amount of Fuller's Earth in my field was rather small, but to the right and left of it, in fields belonging to my neighbors, there were much larger quantities of the substance. My neighbors had no idea that their land was as valuable as a gold mine. Naturally, it was in my interest to buy their land before they discovered its true value, but unfortunately, I had no capital with which to do this. So I told the secret to a few of my friends, and they suggested that we should quietly and secretly dig out our own small quantity of Fuller's Earth, and that in this way we would earn enough money to buy the neighboring fields. We have been working secretly like this for some time. One of the machines we use is a press. This press, as I have already explained, is not working properly and we want your advice on the subject. We guard our secret very carefully, and if our neighbors found out that an engineer had visited our little house, our discovery about the Fuller's Earth would not be a secret any longer, and we would have no chance at all of buying those fields and carrying out our plans. That is why I have made you promise me that you will not tell a single human being that you are going to Iford tonight. Do you understand? Yes, I answered, but one point that I do not quite understand is this. How can a press be of any use to you in digging Fuller's earth out of the ground? Ah, he said carelessly, we have our own special way. We use the press to turn the Fuller's earth into bricks so that we can remove the substance without letting the neighbors know what it is. But that is just a detail. I have taken you into my confidence now, Mr. Hatherley, and have shown you that I trust you. He rose as he spoke. I shall expect you then, at Aford, at 11.15. I will certainly be there, and do not say a word about it to anybody. He gave me a last long questioning look, and then, pressing my hand in his, he hurried from the room. Well, gentlemen, when I was alone again, I thought a lot about this visitor and his unusual request. Of course I was glad in a way, because the money he had offered was at least ten times as much as the ordinary pay for such a piece of work, and it was possible that this opportunity would lead to others. But the face and manner of this man had given me a strange feeling, and I did not believe that the story of the Fuller's Earth really explained the necessity for a midnight visit or the conditions of extreme secrecy that were connected with it. But I put my fears to one side, ate a large supper, drove to Paddington, and started off for Eiford. I had obeyed Captain Stark's instructions and had spoken to nobody. At reading I had to change stations, and I caught the last train to Eiford. I reached the dark little station after eleven o'clock. I was the only passenger who got out there, and the only person at the station was a single sleepy railway man holding an oil lamp. As I passed through the gate from the station, I found Captain Stark waiting in the shadows on the other side of the road. Without speaking, he seized me by the arm and hurried me into a carriage. He pulled up the windows on both sides, knocked on the woodwork as a signal to the driver, and we set off as fast as the horse could go. One horse? Holmes interrupted. Yes, only one. Did you notice what color it was? Yes, I saw by the light of the carriage lamps as I was stepping in. It was light brown. Was it tired looking or fresh? Oh, its coat looked quite fresh. Thank you. I am sorry to have interrupted you. Please continue your very interesting story. We drove for at least an hour. 
Captain Stark had said that it was only about seven miles, but the time the journey took and the speed at which we traveled made me think it was really ten or twelve. He sat at my side in silence, watching me carefully all the time. The country roads must have been rather bad, as the carriage shook and moved violently up and down as we went along. I tried to look out of the windows to see where we were, but they were made of colored glass, and I could see nothing except occasional faint lights. Now and then, I spoke to the captain, but he answered only yes or no, and the conversation went no further. At last, the shaking of the carriage stopped, and we drove over a smooth private road. Our journey was over. Captain Stark jumped out, and as I followed, pulled me quickly through the open front door of the house. We stepped right out of the carriage into the hall, so that I was quite unable to get any idea of what the outside of the house looked like. As soon as I was inside the house, the door was shut violently behind us, and I heard the faint sound of wheels as the carriage drove away. It was completely dark inside the house, and the captain began looking for matches, talking to himself as he did so. Suddenly a door opened at the other end of the passage, and a golden beam of light appeared. It grew wider, and I saw a woman with a lamp, which she held above her head, pushing her face forward to look at us. I could see that she was pretty and expensively dressed. She said a few words in a foreign language, and when my companion answered with a single cold word, his reply gave her such a shock that she nearly dropped the lamp. Captain Stark went up to her, whispered something in her ear, and pushed her back into the room she had come out of. Then he walked back towards me with the lamp in his hand and opened the door of another room. Please be kind enough to wait in this room for a few minutes, he said. It was a small, plain room, with a round table in the center. There were several German books scattered on this table. The captain put the lamp down on a smaller table by the door. I will not keep you waiting long, he said, and disappeared into the darkness.